July 15, 2023, Amundsen Scott South Pole Station, outside temperature, negative 63 degrees Celsius, wind speed 70 kilometers per hour. The 41 researchers inside won't see the sun for another two months. They're spending the next eight months in a place where exposed skin freezes in under five minutes, where the air is drier than the Sahara Desert, and where a single mechanical failure could turn their heated sanctuary into a tomb of ice. How do you stay warm when you're living on a two-mile-thick sheet of ice where no natural heat exists, where every calorie of warmth must be generated and jealously guarded? How do the buildings resist burial under wind-driven snow? What happens to your body when simply breathing outside can freeze the moisture in your lungs? And when the power fails in the middle of winter darkness, what stands between 41 people and the coldest environment on Earth? This is how researchers survive in Antarctica, not through comfort, but through an intricate system of thermal engineering, material science, and constant vigilance where every design choice is a calculated defense against an environment that never stops trying to kill you. Antarctic cold is not an absence of heat. It's an active force, continuously draining energy from anything warmer than its surroundings. Coastal stations like McMurdo and Palmer regularly experience winter temperatures between negative 20 and negative 40 degrees Celsius. On the high-altitude polar plateau, home to stations like Amundsen-Scott and Vostok, winter temperatures plummet below negative 60 degrees and can dip past negative 80. The world record low, negative 89.2 degrees Celsius, was recorded at Vostok Station, but temperature alone doesn't capture the hostility. Antarctica is home to catabatic winds, dense cold air that flows down the polar plateau under the force of gravity. These winds can be constant and strong, often exceeding 100 kilometers per hour. They strip heat from exposed skin and equipment with terrifying efficiency. A temperature of negative 30 degrees can feel like negative 55 on the wind chill index. Frostbite on exposed skin occurs in under five minutes. For months during the austral winter, the sun does not rise above the horizon. This polar night means there is no solar energy to warm surfaces. The ice sheet radiates what little heat it has out into space, making the surface even colder than the air above it. The landscape offers no natural refuge, no geothermal heat, no combustible material like wood, no liquid water. Survival is 100% dependent on imported technology and fuel. The human body, unprotected, would lose consciousness in minutes and perish shortly after. The air is so cold it can freeze the moisture in your lungs, causing irreparable damage. It's a dry cold. The air has almost zero humidity, leading to rapid dehydration through breathing alone, even as you're surrounded by 70% of Earth's fresh water locked in ice. The primary defense is the research station itself. These are not just buildings. They're engineered life support systems designed as thermal fortresses. Modern stations on the ice sheet are elevated on hydraulic legs or pillars, raised two to three meters above the surface. This design feature combats snow accumulation. Antarctica experiences persistent light snow and immense windblown drift. A building on the surface would quickly be buried, with the weight of snow eventually threatening to crush it. By raising the station, wind flows underneath, scouring the snow away and preventing drifts from forming. Halley 6 sits on skis, allowing it to be relocated periodically as the ice shelf it sits on moves toward the sea. The walls, roof, and floor use structural insulated panels. These composite panels are typically 150 to 300 millimeters thick, consisting of a core of rigid foam insulation bonded between two structural facings. This creates an incredibly strong, lightweight, and supremely insulated building envelope. The thermal resistance is exceptionally high, drastically reducing the amount of heat that can escape. The entire living module functions like a premium quality thermos flask. Windows are a major source of heat loss, so they're minimized in size and number and highly engineered. They're typically triple glazed, sometimes quadruple glazed. Multiple panes of glass are separated by gaps filled with argon or krypton, inert gases that conduct heat more poorly than air, creating a powerful thermal break. The frames use materials with low thermal conductivity and are fitted with multiple gaskets to ensure a perfect, airtight seal. 
but perfect insulation creates a new problem. An uncontrolled draft is fatal, so every joint and seam is meticulously sealed to make the structure as airtight as possible. A sealed box, however, accumulates carbon dioxide, humidity, and contaminants. Stations solve this with a heat recovery ventilator. Stale, warm, humid air from inside is exhausted through the ventilator. As it passes out, it flows over a heat exchange core. Simultaneously, fresh, frigid, dry air from outside is drawn in over the other side of the core. The core transfers up to 80 to 90 percent of the heat from the outgoing air to the incoming air, warming it significantly before it enters the station. This provides essential fresh air without the massive energy penalty of heating it from negative 50 degrees. No one simply walks in or out. Buildings are equipped with Arctic hatches, airlock-style vestibules. To enter, you open the outer door, step into a small, unheated chamber, close the outer door firmly, and only then open the inner door to the heated living space. This two-door system prevents wind from blasting directly into the station and minimizes the exchange of warm and cold air. The warmth and electricity that make life possible are generated on-site, almost exclusively from diesel fuel. This fuel is the station's lifeblood, delivered by icebreaker ships once per year during the brief summer window. Large stations are powered by a series of diesel generators housed in a dedicated power module. For a station like Amundsen-Scott, this involves multiple generators, each capable of producing hundreds of kilowatts. Diesel is energy dense, relatively stable to transport, and the generator technology is robust and reliable. Essential qualities when maintenance is difficult and failure is not an option. Special winterized fuel blends resist gelling and freezing at extreme temperatures. No station relies on a single generator. The standard is an N plus one or N plus two system. If the station requires two generators to run, they will have at least a third or fourth identical generator ready to take over instantly in case of failure or for routine maintenance. Redundancy is life. A diesel engine is fundamentally inefficient. Only about 30 to 40 percent of the fuel's energy becomes electricity. The majority is lost as heat through the engine block and exhaust. In Antarctica, this waste is the single most valuable resource for heating. A liquid coolant, typically a mix of water and glycol, circulates through jackets around the engine blocks of the running generators. This coolant absorbs the intense heat produced by the engines. The superheated glycol solution is then pumped through a closed-loop network of insulated pipes that run throughout the entire station. The hot pipes run to radiators in every room, to heat exchangers for the ventilation system, and most critically, to the water production system. There is no liquid water in Antarctica. All fresh water must be created by melting snow. The hot glycol from the generator cooling loop is pumped through coils inside a large insulated chamber known as a snow melter. A crew member or machine continuously feeds snow into this chamber. The heat from the coils melts the snow, and the resulting water is collected in heated tanks, treated and distributed for drinking, cooking, and sanitation. This process transforms the primary waste product of electricity generation into the station's second most critical resource. Every drop of fuel generates both a watt of power and a unit of heat. The efficiency of this cogeneration is a cornerstone of Antarctic survival. When a researcher must leave the station, their survival depends on a multi-layered clothing system known as the Extreme Cold Weather Kit. The philosophy is not just to insulate, but to manage moisture and adapt to changing conditions. Multiple thin layers are far more effective than one thick one. They trap air between them, the ultimate insulator, and allow for adjustments. As activity levels change, layers can be added or removed to prevent sweating, which is extremely dangerous. The base layer sits directly against the skin. It's made from synthetics like polypropylene or merino wool. Its sole purpose is to pull sweat away from the body and move it to the outer layers where it can evaporate. It is not primarily for warmth. Cotton is forbidden as a base layer. It absorbs moisture like a sponge and holds it against the skin where it freezes, robbing the body of heat and rapidly accelerating the onset of hypothermia. In Antarctic lexicon, cotton kills, 
The mid-layer provides the primary insulation, fleece of varying thicknesses, down-filled jackets, or synthetic fill puffy jackets trap a large volume of air, which is then warmed by body heat. Multiple mid-layers can be worn depending on the temperature and planned exertion level. A scientist standing still to take measurements will wear more insulation than a mechanic actively working on a vehicle. The shell layer is made from durable, windproof, and water-resistant fabric, often Gore-Tex or a similar membrane. This is the iconic Big Red Parka provided by the United States Antarctic Program. This layer's job is to protect the insulating layers from the elements. It completely blocks the wind, preventing convective heat loss. It must also be breathable, allowing the moisture wicked by the base layer to escape as vapor. If it were not breathable, sweat would get trapped, freeze, and compromise the entire system. The body's survival mechanism in extreme cold is to restrict blood flow to the extremities to protect the vital organs. This makes hands, feet, and the head highly susceptible to frostbite. A person can lose up to 50% of their body heat through an uncovered head. A fleece or wool beanie is standard, often worn under the insulated hood of the parka. A balaclava or neck gaiter protects the face and neck. High-quality double-lensed goggles create an insulating air gap to prevent the surface of the eye from freezing and offer protection from wind and the intense UV radiation reflected off the snow. Hands use a two-part system, thin liner gloves for dexterity, worn inside massive, heavily insulated outer mittens. For delicate work, you might remove the outer mitten for a minute, but never the liner glove. The classic white bunny boot, the vapor barrier boot, is a masterpiece of cold weather engineering. It uses a sealed air gap and layers of wool or felt for insulation. The key is that it's waterproof inside and out, preventing sweat from degrading the insulation. Wearers use two socks, a thin liner sock and a thick wool sock. Crucially, boots are never laced too tightly, as this would restrict blood flow and lead to cold feet regardless of the insulation. The environment is merciless on materials. Technology designed for temperate climates fails in ways that range from inconvenient to fatal. Standard steel can become as brittle as glass. Tools can shatter if dropped. Specialized low-temperature alloys are used for critical equipment. Conventional oils and greases turn into solid wax. Vehicles and machinery require special synthetic lubricants designed to function at negative 50 degrees or lower. A battery's chemical reaction slows dramatically in the cold. A fully charged battery can lose over 50% of its effective capacity. Vehicle batteries are kept warm with heating pads. Handheld electronics like radios or GPS units are kept inside a jacket, close to the body, where your own heat keeps them functional. The human body becomes a furnace. A person working outside can burn over 6,000 calories a day, not from exertion, but from the sheer metabolic effort of maintaining a core temperature of 37 degrees. Station diets are calorie dense with plenty of fats and carbohydrates to provide the necessary fuel. Under eating directly reduces your core temperature. Fatigue equals cold equals danger. The Antarctic air is drier than the Sahara Desert. With every breath, the body loses a significant amount of moisture. Dehydration is a constant risk because the cold suppresses the sensation of thirst. Everyone must make a conscious effort to drink several liters of water a day, even when they don't feel thirsty. No one works alone in the deep field. People are trained to constantly check their own face and their partner's face for signs of frostbite, typically waxy, white patches on the cheeks, nose, or earlobes. Since frostbite numbs the area, a person often doesn't realize they have it until someone else points it out. Your own survival mechanism, the restriction of blood flow to extremities, creates the primary injury vector, and you can't feel it happening. In an environment where help is thousands of miles and months away, every system must have a backup, and every person must be prepared for the worst case scenario. The greatest fear in Antarctica is not the cold, but fire. The dry air and high winds can turn a small spark into an inferno in seconds. A station fire would not only destroy the only shelter, but would also consume all supplies. Stations are built with fire retardant materials and divided into fire-contained modules. Sophisticated smoke and heat detection systems are everywhere. Water is useless for firefighting as it would instantly freeze and cause more damage. 
instead chemical suppression systems like FM200 or Novex 1230 gas are used in critical areas like power plants and data centers. These can extinguish a fire without damaging electronics. Fire drills are constant and rigorous. Every field expedition and even every vehicle trip away from the main station is a self-contained survival mission. Every vehicle contains enough food, fuel, and survival gear for its occupants to survive for several days if it breaks down. Every person deployed in the field has a survival bag containing a polar-rated sleeping bag, a single-person tent, a small stove, fuel, high-energy food rations, and basic communication tools. This is their personal lifeboat. For long-range scientific traverses, teams create depots of food and fuel along their route, ensuring they are never more than a day's travel from essential supplies. The ultimate failure is a complete loss of power and heat at the station during winter, a dark station event. Every station has a detailed emergency plan for this. This often involves evacuating the main buildings to a smaller, more easily heated emergency shelter or using backup diesel-fired heaters to keep a small core area livable until the main power can be restored. The entire Winter Over crew is trained to execute this plan. It is a scenario that is constantly prepared for and deeply respected. The icebreaker arrives once per year. Miss that delivery window and you wait 12 or more months without critical parts or fuel. Redundancy is not paranoia. It is the minimum viable safety margin when rescue is physically impossible for eight months of the year. Antarctica operates on physics so extreme that normal engineering rules invert. Waste becomes a resource. Inefficiency becomes essential. Your body's protective mechanisms become threats. Every layer of clothing, every cubic meter of insulated space, every liter of diesel fuel is a calculated move in a constant game against an environment that never stops trying to equalize temperatures. And equalization means death. The researchers who winter over at these stations aren't just conducting science. They're inhabiting one of the few places on Earth where human survival is entirely artificial where every breath of warm air and every drop of liquid water exists only because someone designed a system, maintained a machine, and watched the gauges. It's a testament to what humans can endure when the alternative is simple extinction. If this video gave you a new appreciation for the engineering that makes impossible places livable, consider subscribing. There are more extreme environments to explore and more systems that stand between humans and the void.